What's up guys? So it's come to my attention that a lot of people are interested in research and I want to make sure I get my two cents out there. So I want to help you all understand what research is and how to go about getting research and how to do it well. And that's what this video is all about. Let's do it. What's up everybody? So it hit me the other day that I've had this channel for so long and I have not talked about research and research is one of my biggest passions, in particular biomedical research, uh, more on the basic science side. So I'm going to go ahead and make this presentation, but I have so much to say on research that believe it or not, I actually am going to have two videos on this. Video one, which is this video, is going to introduce you to what research is because I know a lot of people out there don't know what real basic science research is. And then I'm going to go into how to get research, even at a 35,000 student university which is where I went. I went to a 35,000 student university. So I want to make sure that you know how to get research. Video two in the future is going to be talking about how to do research well because I know a lot of people out there do research but believe it or not not a lot of people do research well. I was fortunate enough to have great mentors and you know get the motivation to do research well and I was also even fortunate enough to have a publication and an honors thesis and a senior thesis so I think I learned a bit and I want to share that with all of you and hopefully get you to learn from my experiences but for right now let's focus on video one let's get into what is research and how to get research the big question is here what is research notice this asterisk is here to let you know I'm going to be talking mostly to mostly about science research and even within science there's two types of science research basic science research and clinical research, just know that this presentation is more relevant to basic science research, but it's still applicable to both basic science and clinical research. Let's now try to address that question. I'm going to try to show you what research is just through this one picture. All right. If you are looking at this from a student perspective with a non-research perspective, you would say that this is the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA to RNA to protein, and you would be completely right. If you are a student, you might also say that this is a diagram commonly found in textbooks. I would totally agree with you. However, if you are a researcher, if you're looking at this from a research perspective and you wanted to know what research was, research is how this image was created. That's how crazy research is. Research was the process through which, first of all, we learned that DNA was a double helix molecule. Research is the process through which we learned DNA was double-stranded. Research is the process through which we learned DNA had adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uh, thymine. Notice how there is so much in there that we take for granted because it just shows up in a textbook. But research is responsible for all of that. You might know that Watson and Crick were the ones who did the experiments uh, with the help of Rosalind Franken to figure out DNA structure. You may also know that there were Messelson and Stahl that helped us understand that DNA was replicating in a semi-conservative manner. These are all researchers who experimented and told us the knowledge we have today. And all of that exemplifies what research is. Everything in your textbook is made from research. Basic experiments that ultimately help us understand the fundamentals of life is research. So that may have made sense to you, but if it didn't, just by its mere name, I want you to know research means searching over and over again. It means you ask a question and run experiments to find out the answer. For example, Watson and Crick's question was, what is the structure of DNA? And they ran experiments to figure it out. Messelson and Stahl's question was, how does DNA replicate? And they used experiments to figure it out. In biology, research usually means looking into a very, very, very specific topic. A lot of people have this misconception that research is huge. Like, I can use research to cure, or cure Alzheimer's. That may be true, but research is intended to answer a very, very specific question. Like for example, one of my big research projects was literally understanding how one particular region of a protein interacts uh, with another region of that protein when that protein is in a particular solution. Like think about how specific of a question that is. And with that being said, I want you to now understand the difference between research and academics because most undergrads treat research as academics when it's really not. Research is much, much harder than academics. Research is literally academics on steroids, right? So when I say this, I know that many of you have taken general biology as a pre-med class, and I'm sure many of you would agree that it's a very difficult class. But as students, the good part was all you had to do in, in an academic forum of biology is learn the material. On the other hand, let's now understand how research would work for general biology. Research is how general biology was made. If you approach the class of general biology as a researcher, you literally have to like understand where the material is coming from. From, For example, how did they determine what DNA polymerase does? How do they know that DNA polymerase only makes one mistake per billion base pairs? Because I know many of you have heard that, right? You know DNA polymerase makes one mistake for every billion base pairs or so that it replicates. How did they figure that out? That's what a researcher is asking. What kind of questions, what kind of experiments did they do to figure that out? 
another research question they often ask is how do they determine where transcription factors bind to in DNA? Because I know in academics, they just tell you transcription factors bind here. A researcher would ask, why do they bind here? Why don't they bind here or here or here? What about this specific region makes this protein bind here? Those are research questions. So now I hope you understand the difference between academics and research. Academics is very cold, hard facts, but research is understanding where those cold, hard facts came from. We've gotten to talk a bit about what research is, but now I want to get into the nitty gritty of how to actually get research because I know that's what most of you care about. I know you want to get in the lab and get things done and I want to support you in that. The biggest thing to get research is this thing called a curriculum vitale. I don't know if I'm even saying that right. It's called a CV. I always call it a CV. And what I need all of you to do is make a CV. A CV is an in-depth document about your academic history. It's generally focused on academics, not necessarily extracurricular activities. So I know many of you might be asking, how is this different from a resume? A resume is basically all about you, what you do, your extracurriculars, what your life is like, your personality, all that jazz. A CV focuses entirely on academics. What kind of classes have you taken? What kind of labs have you been in before? What kind of lab classes have you taken? Um, is there anything that you've participated in in school that reflects your interest in academics? So for example, service clubs and what you do outside of school are not relevant in a CV because service clubs obviously don't have anything to do with academics. On the other hand, you want to talk on your CV more about what is directly applicable to your career. And usually it's related to research or some sort of learning or teaching aspect. So let me give you an example. On my CV, I talk a lot about uh, teaching and tutoring. And that's totally fine because that tells a lot of uh, people who are looking at your CV about your academic history. If you're interested in tutoring, they want to know what you tutor, what subjects you tutor. Another thing you want to have on your CV is what kind of classes you have, uh, what kind of experience you have in a lab if you've been in another, another lab before. So all of this comes together to make your CV and the cool part about a CV, which is untrue about a resume. So a resume, people often say you want to keep it short and simple and sweet. A CV can be longer than one page. A CV is supposed to kind of give a professor who looks at this everything about you academically. Do you love biology? Do you love um, chemistry? Do you love physics? What do you love? What specific experiences have you had there that tells me you are credible to do research in my lab, right? And so CV is basically a resume except academically oriented. So some of you may be wondering, how do I know what a CV looks like if I haven't made one yet? Here's an example. I want you guys to go to this link. I'm going to actually just exit out of this right now and I'm going to take you onto my Google Chrome and show you what this links look like. But this is a uh, CV of a professor at UC Berkeley. His CV is insanely great, but uh, at least it'll give you all an example and hopefully you can learn from that and make your own CV. I'll make a video on how to make a CV later, but at least this is a good place to start because making your CV is the first step. So let's look at this guy's CV. Here we are with the example CV. Again, Professor Carlos Bustamante from UC Berkeley. So before we even move forward with this, I want you to know that this person is a professor Professor and that to at Berkeley, which means he's really good at research. He's really good at what he does. Uh, but in general, let's go ahead and work through this. So you'll see that it's his name. It says it's his CV. It tells his department. Notice that this is 44 pages, by the way. I don't expect your CV to be this long. I just want you to give an example. So now look, he goes through his education. He goes through his languages. He goes through his postdoc. He goes through his academic administration. And then slowly he just goes down his honors and his appointments and where he's worked and his memberships, and then the rest of this is just publications. The next 41, 44 pages is literally just publications. So if you go through this, they're just publications he's written. But the point that I want to make here is you are not a professor, but I want you to see like the kind of things that are involved here. Notice that this is all academic. Oh, at the end, he has places that he's spoken, I think. So you'll see here he says, Oh, member, member. But I think he eventually goes down at the last few pages and talks about places he's spoken. But the point is, notice that this is all academic for him. It's stuff that he's done academically. For you, it won't be the same thing. It'll probably be a lot more about what classes have you taken? What lab classes have you taken? What are you interested in? What aspect of... Uh, you know, science do you like? How have you exemplified that passion for science? Do you teach science? Do you tutor in science? Tell me about it, okay? Because if you don't have any research experience, you kind of have to fall back on basically what kind of classes you have, what you loved in those classes, what techniques you learned in those classes, what techniques you learned in the labs of those classes. But trust me, you can still make a phenomenal CV. And I don't know if I'll do this yet, but if you email me really nicely, I may send my CV over too. So just email me and uh, I can try to do that for you guys. But yeah, hope you found this helpful. This is what a CV looks like. So ultimately this is 44 pages, but the link is below so you can refer to it on your own as well. So now we know what a CV 
looks like. You might be wondering, why is this relevant? This is relevant because to get research, you want to have a CV to give to Perspective Labs. When you give a resume, it kind of looks unprofessional because in the research realm, CV is the name of the game. CV tells the lab your academic background and potential specialization slash interest. So if you're applying to a molecular biology lab, you better damn well talk about some molecular biology techniques, PCR, qPCR, GFP, fluorescence understanding, microscopy understanding, what about you is important. And as I already mentioned, the good part is now that you have a CV, you can attach it to emails because now I'm going to show you how to get research and this method will 100% work. You just have to follow it. Watch. What you have to do is once you have your CV, you will now prep an email. Okay, you will say hello professor x. Notice the x can be replaced with, replaced with any professor's name that you're interested in. You will then start your first paragraph by introducing yourself. Uh, discuss your previous experiences and your previous research experiences. If you have no research experiences, focus on your classes and labs that relate to that research or the particular field of research you're interested in, right? Paragraph 2. Reinforce that you have a genuine interest in the lab and you're ready to commit x hours per week. Usually that's anywhere between 10 to 25. Paragraph three will be take me into consideration, please. You want to somehow basically make a plea to the professor to take you into consideration, tell them you're assigning, you're attaching your CV and then you sign off. The good part is in those three paragraphs, notice how you said nothing specific about the lab. You only talked about yourself and your particular interest in the field of research the professor is in. So I will tell you this right now. I was trying to get into my a lab uh, my sophomore year and my senior year. I took this template and I basically did exactly what I said. And the good part was I knew I wanted to do research in the field of molecular biology. So all I said was I'm really passionate about molecular biology. Here are the particular techniques I'm passionate about. Here are the particular things I know, particular classes I've taken, particular research labs I've been in before. And if you're interested, let me know because I have a genuine interest in your lab and I would really appreciate if you took me into consideration. I'm attaching my CV, by the way. It has all my background on it. So if you want to talk more, let me know. And the good part is, do you see how I did not mention anything about the professor there? That basically means you can use what I just said as a template and send that off to hundreds and hundreds of professors. And all you have to do is change this top part change the professor's name. And this is basically dependent on the law of large numbers. If you do something to a large enough degree, you will be successful. Some of you might think, professors won't email me back, man. I'm not, I don't want to get rejected. Get used to it, buddy. You will be rejected. But the good part is if you send out 150 emails, you will get at least three or four positive responses who will, uh, from professors who say, I appreciate you reaching out. Why don't we talk about this over coffee? And then you got yourself, you got your foot in the door. Uh, if you want to know the template I sent to get my research position, I will send it to you. You need to email me first at pjathani at berkeley.edu and I will be more than happy to send you my research template that I used to secure research successfully all four years during my time at Berkeley. And notice this is just physical proof. Notice that I repeated this email a lot. I said the exact same subject, exact same body. And the other good part is now when a professor emails you back, that's when I will tell you, you have to take your shit seriously at that point. You have to start reading that professor's papers because now you have to know what that professor is actually doing. So that's what I'm saying. This is technically not dishonest because um, I'm basically getting you to be more optimized with your time, right? Because when you get positive responses, you can read the papers of the lab afterwards. Because I know some people that send their email out and they read papers from the lab before. And I'm like, why would you do that? You're wasting your time. You don't even know if the professor will say yes to you. So why not send out a generic email first, see what professor wants you, and then read the professor's papers. You save time, you save sanity, and you keep yourself sane and optimize time. All right. And the good part is you can actually go to each lab that gives you a yes, we want you to come into our lab and see. And the good part is because you will likely get more than one positive, you can go into each lab and see what you want. See if you mesh well with the people in the lab. See if the lab has good mentors for you. Because the number one thing in a lab is if he doesn't have good mentors, you don't want to be there. And again, the beauty of all of this is you are now in control. You email 150 professors, you get four responses that say, yes, we'd be interested in you having, we'd be interested in having you in our lab. Now you can go to each of those four and see which one you like the best and pick that one. Do you see how brilliant this is? It works, okay? And it personally worked really well for me, all right? So with that being said, I hope you guys understand now how to get research. Please let me know if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. This this method, I know sending out 150 emails might be difficult, but when you're copying and pasting, it takes an hour, okay? And I know it will save you time, and I know it will get you research. And if you have a success story, let me know over email, and I'd love to hear about it. All right, thanks for watching. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next video.